Hello, and welcome to the Evelyn Y. Davis Studios at the National Press Foundation. Today we're talking about biotech advances in prescription drugs. In a minute, we'll talk about biologics, how they differ from conventional drugs, and what reporters need to know. The National Press Foundation is a nonprofit dedicated to helping journalists cover complex topics with depth and accuracy. Our mission includes journalists around the U.S. and around the world. I'm Sandy Johnson, President of the National Press Foundation. With me today are two experts on prescription drugs. Dr. Dr. Catherine Zoon is Chief of Cytokine Biology at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at NIH. Ed Silverman is joining us remotely. Ed writes Pharmalot, a respected blog that tracks the pharmaceutical industry. Pharmalot has a new home at the Boston Globe's website, STAT. We'll be using a lot of science jargon today, so I suggest you open the link to the glossary that we have provided. So let's start with the basics. What are biologics? Dr. Zoon? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Sandy. It's a, a pleasure to be here and uh, to discuss biologics. It's been a passion of mine over the past 40 years to work in this area, so I think uh, it should be uh, a great pleasure to help people understand what is the difference between a drug and biologic? Because I think that's always a major, a major question. So the first slide uh, gives us a definition of a, a biologic. Uh, and it's interesting if you look at the definition of a biological, it looks rather archaic. And the reason it looks archaic is because this original definition has evolved since the early 1900s when the Biologics Control Act was originally passed by Theodore Roosevelt. And it dealt with a problem uh, with the production of a molecule that made children sick. So Congress with uh, President Roosevelt at the time uh, became very much involved in the regulation of these products. Now, they have evolved over time and are now governed by what's called the Public Health Service Act. And over time, they've added a, a variety of different products to the list of biologicals. And I think you can see on the slide some of the more common ones that people may be familiar with today. Uh, one of which is vaccines. Many of us every year go dutifully for our influenza vaccine. And this is something that's regulated as a biologic. Uh, allergenic extracts, if you have hay fever, if you're allergic to cat dander, uh, and you go to an allergist, they'll test you for various allergies. And those extracts are regulated as biologics. Mm -hmm. uh, blood and blood products, the safety of our blood supply and the safety of blood products like red cells, platelets, things that are present in blood, plasma, uh, immunoglobulins uh, are all present um, as biologics. And if you go down further, you'll see that there's some uh, inner disbursement of both new products and things that we wouldn't have considered new but are newly regulated under the Public Health Service Act. Cell and gene therapy products are things that we now have uh, that we can replace cartilage in a, in a knee, for instance. Uh, gene therapy is still evolving, uh, but this has a lot of promise uh, for the future and I think will be something we we'll may be talking about a little bit later. Human tissue is, is something new that's regulated, that tissue had become contaminated with viruses or bacteria which gave people infections, so that is now regulated as a biologic. Uh, we also have certain devices and test kits associated with blood safety that are regulated as, as biological products, um, mm -hmm. but they're very specific to particular uh, blood and blood products. Um, newer products, which are probably the ones that are most uh, interested in the biotech arena, are monoclonals and cytokines and growth factors. 
For monoclonal antibodies, as many of uh, us know, we have an immune system. And our immune system makes molecules that can combat infections. They can be a protective device against cancer. So these are now products that are made from cells of our immune system that are able to fight these kinds of infections. And because they're very specific, uh, they can be made from a, a single cell into large quantities of cells that produce these particular molecules. Mm -hmm. Ed, let's bring you into the conversation. How do these new biotech-driven drugs differ from uh, conventional drugs? Well, conventional drugs for many years have largely been pills, and they've evolved from chemistry, whereas Biologics, as the name implies, evolves from biology. And that's a much more complicated process to achieve with much more, not only scientific effort, but manufacturing effort. And as a result, is also a uh, more involved, let's call it regulatory process. So uh, those are some very broad but key distinctions right there. Yeah, I think just to... Uh, augment a little bit, Ed, normally biologics come from a living source. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, and because of their complexity, uh, they tend to be uh, less uh, stable, so that means they're more fragile. Uh, they, re they can be changed rather easily during the production process so that they can actually change and not be active, or they could become unsafe by looking as foreign to the body so that the body will reject those molecules. So if you look at uh, biologicals, um, they're all different kinds. Most of them uh, relate to proteins. They can be um, very complex. I um, basically allude to them as a Lego set, which has many, many pieces in it. And if you don't get the pieces right, the structure doesn't look correct and won't perform correctly. And that's really a lot related to how a biological acts in terms of its structure. And this could be uh, a structure that is made up of many sugars, it could be made up of many building blocks for proteins, which are called amino acids. And uh, they can be made up of nucleic acid building blocks, which make up an R ribonucleic acid, or RNA, or a DNA, which contains genes. So these are all very, very important. We also have things that are living cells uh, or viruses uh, that are reduced in their potency, but can protect against infection. So for instance, uh, we have uh, vaccines that are made up of basically crippled viruses that the body can make uh, immune response to, but um, don't give you an infection. And that prevents you from infections in the future. Uh, the other thing that we can do is inactivate a uh, bacteria or a virus, and that can be used to uh, cause an immune response to protect you against either that virus or that bacteria. And these are all biologics. Now, the complexity with not only the structure of these uh, molecules, but also uh, because during their processing, um, you need to have very strict conditions on how they're processed and manufactured. Otherwise, these molecules won't perform the way you think they should. And mm -hmm. that's really the difference. A drug has a very defined structure. You know where every atom is, and you can define that very atom. So you don't really pay as much attention because you can completely characterize a drug versus a biologic which is almost impossible with today's technology to completely characterize. Mm -hmm. and so that, conventional drugs are more of a factory style process. Once you get the structure of it down, it can be replicated over and over again. And the mm -hmm. structure can be confirmed down to the molecular level. Mm -hmm. Whereas biologics, uh, where you can have some idea of the structure and some of the critical factors, 
you really don't have the technology yet today to give you the whole structure to make sure that it's proper for the indication in which it's going to be used. Mm -hmm. Dr. Zun, let's get back to your slides. I know you had another one on, um, I think, technology and, um, right. right, how, so oh, I think we, yeah, we, we can covered. go past that one. There we go. The, yeah. the history of biotech products, um, which go way back. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, way back is, a, you know, not as far as 1902, mm -hmm. but back to the early 70s where um, the recombinant DNA technology first evolved, and this was a, a major milestone for the whole field of biotechnology. And this uh, really took us to another dimension. It allowed us to make molecules that were present in very small quantities in the body and make large amounts of them. Uh, and what you can see is there's a number of uh, of drugs and biologics that were made at that time. One is insulin, which was made from a microorganism that had the insulin uh, gene in it. So that was one of the first uh, recombinant products. And then that was followed by a product in the immune system called interferon. Uh, and interferon is, is a molecule which is produced by a cell which modulates the immune system in many immune cells. And it, it's one of the first lines of defense of the body against an infection. And today, interferon has been approved and used for um, hepatitis B and hepatitis C. It's also been approved for a number of cancers as well because it allows the immune system to activate and target cancer cells. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so the, the, let's fast forward a little bit to the last, what would it be, five years or so right. when biologic drugs have really taken off. That's correct. What was the trigger for that? Was it, well, go ahead. Well, I think there's two pieces to this. One is the trigger was the technology for getting uh, better systems to make biotech products and making them uh, with uh, better reproducibility and the ability to monitor this production and activity has improved greatly over time. Uh, the advent of monoclonal antibodies, which I alluded to, uh, which are also uh, uh, molecules which are part of our immune system, uh, are produced uh, by immune cells, and they can be used for infections, like such as Synegas, which is for um, respiratory syncytial virus, which is very um, a, a very terrible disease for babies, uh, and also uh, can be used uh, for um, things like cancer uh, and for acute uh, rejection of organs such as OKT3. So I think these are all very important new discoveries. And we've learned over the past, I would say, 10 years to make monoclonal antibodies more human-like. Originally, they started out making them in mice. And many times, people would develop antibodies. Their own immune system would reject them. But now we can humanize them so that our bodies don't reject these um, particular molecules, which is a big uh, advance in the area. And, mm -hmm. and now we can grow them in large quantities. We're being able to manufacture these molecules, um, what I would say, more expeditiously and probably less costly because we understand more about how they are made. Mm -hmm. And Ed, how have these changes in the last five to 10 years affected um, how you do your job, how journalists do their job on reporting on the industry? Well, the biologics offer a couple of interesting opportunities and challenges. Um, on one hand, they represent significant advances in how uh, medicines are developed and therefore how patients are treated. So there's opportunity to look at uh, real life examples. See how over time um, a drug that was new at whatever stage eight years ago, three years ago, has made a difference for, for patients and how that's helped um, doctors make better treatment decisions and potentially lower health care costs because if there's a, a treatment that um, can prevent or, or cure an illness, then the 
patient doesn't have to encounter other sorts of health care costs and the system as a whole benefits. So that's one way of looking at it, one way to pursue it. Um, but I mentioned the word cost, and that also has increasingly been uh, a driver of coverage of medicines in general and these types of medicines more particularly because many of these medicines cost a lot more than a conventional pill would cost. And the medicines can cost tens of thousands of dollars. More recently, the last couple of years or so, we're seeing even bigger price tags, sometimes for very uh, unusual or rare diseases. Nonetheless, though, they're, they're high priced. And so that spills into the whole debate about the cost of medicines, because unlike a pill where eventually when a patent expires, a generic, a lower cost generic pill becomes available in this country, we don't, we, we're the first now on the verge of having access to FDA approved uh, treatments that are equivalent, the generic equivalent, that, that's a colloquial term I'm using. In, in industry parlance, it's called a biosimilar, something mm -hmm. that's similar to a biologic. And these would be priced perhaps 15 to 30% lower than a biologic. And using the same uh, assumptions, the health system could save money down the road. Uh, so this the pricing, the cost, that, again, factors into a much larger story. But going back to my first point, um, the cool thing is that there's continual research efforts that are advancing our, our, our overall scientific knowledge that makes medical practice more efficient and successful. And um, while everything is, you know, always a moving target, there's plenty of opportunities for stories that look at how um, these treatments are playing out. And I, uh, I was recently working at the Wall Street Journal, and a colleague spent an enormous amount of time doing what is essentially a, a large human interest project where he spoke to, um, or at least ended up writing about, I think it was five different cancer patients who were getting different uh, treatments, a new type of cancer treatment called an immunotherapy that works on the immune system to actually ward off or fight back against tumors. And he followed some of these people and told their stories in some detail, along with comments from their physicians and some drug makers, about how these treatments were making a difference, even though they're nascent, even though they are not 100% um, foolproof for every patient. But it is still the contrast was remarkable to what we have available you know, pick any time in the recent past, five or ten years ago. So that that poses a lot of opportunity, a lot of fun, because you can really learn about the science and patient care as, as you go about pursuing that kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. This might be the point to talk a little bit about research and development. Um, pharmaceutical companies uh, rack up enormous R and D costs, and uh, that's one of the one of the reasons that they attribute to the cost of these, the exorbitant costs of the new biologics. Uh, could um, could either of you d tell tell journalists a little bit more about the R and D process and why it's so arduous? Yeah, well, there's so many stages in drug development, and we'll talk about uh, in a few minutes about the clinical development, which is the most expensive part of, and that's actually quite similar for drugs and biologics. I think when you're first developing a biologic or uh, in this case, a bio, biotech product. Um, especially at the beginning, there were a lot of failures at the early development stage. So maybe one out of 10 or out of 20 molecules actually did what someone thought they might be able to do. So a lot of, not only are they expensive to make, but actually, honing in on a indication for those particular molecules or a disease for those particular molecules where you can show that they're safe and effective, uh, at the beginning of this had a very, uh, not a very good track record, quite honestly. As we got better and really understood how these molecules work at the basic science level, then we became, I think, more sophisticated uh, about how to target molecules, how to develop these molecules, which I think today 
uh, really reflects a better success rate, especially for things like monoclonal antibodies, where we can have a much better uh, sense of how they can be effective. I just want to make one point um, uh, going back to costs of biologics. I agree with Ed uh, uh, wholeheartedly for the biotech products. I think those tend to be quite expensive. But I don't, I don't think we should overlook the fact that many vaccines are actually quite inexpensive to make. Uh, something like a, a, a defective viral vaccine could cost pennies a dose. And in fact, uh, those are being uh, used uh, right now throughout the world to combat uh, serious infectious diseases. So I think we really need, when we're saying biologics, make sure that we're talking uh, about the biotech products. You know, one of the things I think that makes um, biologics, because of the nature of how they're manufactured, uh, is often you have to build a plant a whole manufacturing plant to uh, develop uh, the processes and make product in. And that's very expensive. You need large pieces of equipment. You need buildings. You need uh, specialized equipment and specialized tests, all of which goes into the cost. Even after it's discovered, uh, one needs to make sure that you could reproduce what you discovered at a large scale. And that scale up of a product is not trivial. It requires a lot of technical ability in biopharmaceutical manufacturing, which in essence is a field unto its own self. And I think uh, requires a lot more in terms of what it takes to manufacture a small molecule drug. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really a, a major consideration. Mm -hmm. So um, factories cannot be retrofitted. If you're, if you're a, a pharmaceutical company and you make conventional drugs, you can't retrofit a facility to create biologics. You have to build a new facility. Well, I think if you've had a biologics manufacturer, mm -hmm. depending on the nature of what you made in there, uh, you can, uh, what what is termed as campaigned means that you can make one particular biologic, uh, clean up the whole facility, decontaminate everything, and make sure that it's clean. Uh, then you can go ahead uh, over a period of time and make another biologic. But it's very comprehensive. It's uh, very, very time consuming. And, and it, it requires a lot of effort and time which translates to money. Mm -hmm. So I think um, for small molecules, I think it's, it's, as Ed alluded to, it's really the chemistry of putting it together. The only, the only time I've seen that that's not the case is when it comes from a natural source like Taxol, when it came before they were able to chemically synthesize it and they had to get it from the bark of a yew tree, mm -hmm. that, then that became quite expensive. Uh, to to source. So I think that there's exceptions to every rule, but I think in general, because of the nature of a biologic and especially biotech, it does require very uh, dedicated, often facilities uh, or campaign facilities. Mm -hmm. And how do journalists go about covering the R&D process? Uh, do you think they cover it um, comprehensively? Well,
and fascinating and complicated scientifically and financially because the science is, you know, we've been talking about is, is evolving and moving quicker every year. Um, and I think there's been some really good coverage of that. I think financially, this goes back to cost. There's been a lot of coverage of, of the cost issue, and it, it speaks to drugs in general. Um, the latest figure that the pharmaceutical industry points to is about $2.6 billion to get a drug out the door, at least into the pharmacy, your medicine cabinet, the hospital. Uh, that, that's a rounded number. $2.6 billion. <clears throat> So I just, uh, I think I uh, would like to add just a few points on this, because there, many years ago, the pharmaceutical industry did a lot of its own R&D, and they were quite uh, isolated in terms of uh, deciding how they were going to pursue their pipeline in terms of doing their own research in their own facilities. There's been an evolution with making strategic partnerships now with university, with government institutions, I know we, we do this at NIH as well, uh, have these uh, interactions where the academic or government lab will do the discovery and maybe the initial, what I would call, uh, preclinical evaluation of a molecule. It could be for modulating inflammation, it could be for cancer, it could be for uh, inhibiting viral infections. But a lot of that now is being done basically by either government, academic labs, and then the industry will come in and take, based on some of the preliminary data, uh, to then develop it further. So they, they're looking at de-risking uh, a lot of the development, where they used to do a lot of that on their own. And I think uh, that, I think, will uh, actually uh, probably lead to a more cost-effective 
way for them to develop drugs. Not, not everybody does that. They still do some of their own research, but there's been a real shift in partnering with academic and research, other research institutions. And I think as a result of this, um, a number of the pharmaceutical companies have uh, really decided to specialize in certain things. Uh, some pr do cancer, some do infectious diseases, uh, some do inflammation and, and really making, or others decide that they may want to focus on monoclonal antibodies for a variety of indications. So I think there's more specialization now in areas, especially with a lot of the biotech drugs. Mm -hmm. And how much money does the government put toward that research? Oh, it depends. Uh, I mean, the, N the, you know, the NIH budget is approximately $30 billion. Most of that, not, at least 90%, goes out to academic institutions uh, and other uh, contracts. Uh, so I think, you know, that's a fair investment, but that's not the only investment. There are other institutions that invest in basic research, so uh, it can come from many, many sources. And, um, and I think the interests of uh, various uh, foundations and, and um, organizations will contribute to that, whether It'd be the Gates Foundation that's very interested in global infectious diseases uh, or other um, manufacturing groups which are interested in perhaps cancer, inflammation, and to a certain degree, infectious diseases. But my, my sense is that um, there it's actually more integrated in terms of it's not just somebody in a lab um, and completely separated from the translation of their discovery into a product now. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more, I would say, emphasis on when somebody does discover something, how does that technology get transferred? And because the, you know, the academic institutions and government institutions don't manufacture products in general. Uh, they right. mm -hmm. uh, want to hand those products over to a pharmaceutical company that's far more experienced in preparing those products. You know, I know NIH uh, publishes a list every year of where that $30 billion goes to, the, um, to universities. And do you do much um, coverage of this kind of research at the academic level? Well, as a business writer, I probably spend a little more time looking at the end result or some of the behind the scenes machinations that get get us uh, to the point where the drug is on market. Um, you know, one of the related uh, discussions about uh, that's coming that, that, that's a result of the uh, interactions, relationships between government and, and industry. Uh, has also to do with cost in the sense that um, if a drug was initially discovered, researched by government, and then the patent goes to or certain rights go to a, a drug maker that charges X amount of dollars, there's been ongoing debate within the debate about the extent to which some of that money should go back to taxpayers. So I pay attention to that uh, theme, if you will, because there have been some disputes over the last few years when um, certain drugs are priced at a certain point or there's a, a, an availability issue. Uh, some of these uh, are played on in court, interesting court battles, in fact. Um, yes, that, that probably leads us to talk about the government's role, and um, the ACA addressed the exclusivity issue. Dr. Zoon, do you want to describe what the ACA said about that? Well, I think that um, exclusivity, uh, I'm not familiar with the ACA. What is Oh, uh, Affordable Care Act. Oh, sorry. okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, yes. Well, I think, you know, the issue uh, with the uh, Affordable Care Act and the um, issue of making medicines more accessible, particularly biologics, because because of the price tags associated them with them, has uh, looked at the whole issue of bio biosimilars, and it's a complex issue because 
how similar does something have to be? Uh, and if I could have the slide on biosimilars, please. Uh, which uh, is really important. Uh, a biosimilar really has to be a product which is compared to a reference product, which is something that's already approved by the FDA for a particular clinical indication. Now, um, and you have to show that, that it is similar to that product. Sometimes that's difficult to do with our analytical tools we have currently today. Uh, one needs to do uh, animal studies for, if appropriate, an animal model for efficacy or animal toxicity because minor changes in those products could lead to serious side effects. Uh, then it depends um, on getting data actually in humans. Um, does the half-life of the drug, is it similar to what the inventor drug is? Uh, how the drug is distributed and how the body responds to it, is it similar? And then you have uh, the issues of how do you determine whether or not its clinical efficacy is the same and its safety is the same. How much clinical data does one need to have to make that translation? We don't really have good clinical biomarkers right now for many of these drugs to make that determination. For some, there will be, and they will develop over time. So this is something that I think is quite quite key. And again, remember that biologics, there's a lot of emphasis on the facilities mm -hmm. and how, a, how able are the facilities to make a product reproducibly and, and safely. Mm -hmm. And so all of this, I think, uh, is an, evo an evolution right now. Um, I think we have one um, drug that is recently approved, uh, which is filgrastum, which is a growth factor for uh, important blood cells that fight infection. That's the first one to be approved by the F FDA. And I think over time, as technology improves and our understanding of what minor changes can be acceptable and which ones are not, I have uh, you know, an interesting story. Uh, many, uh, many of the journalists may know about a molecule called TPA. TPA is known as the clot buster. And uh, this is well known, it's been talked about in public before, but a manufacturer actually started out uh, making, uh, growing the cells and making the product in roller bottles. And then they switched to a fermenter it changed the product, final product, by virtue of the fact that there were modifications made to that molecule that changed its ability to circulate in our blood so it was half as effective just by changing how the cells were grown. So these are the things that we have to pay attention to because even within a given manufacturer, when they make a change, when is a change? important to really follow up uh, with some good biological data to make sure that it's performing the way you think it is. And I think that kind of comparison is going to be even more important with biosimilars where you have completely different manufacturers making the product and then assessing whether the product, one, looks like it's supposed to look in terms of its molecular structure but also to perform the way it does. Uh, and particularly for many biologics, the issue of what's called immunogenicity or a rejection of that product by the, by the patient can be very, very important because it could reduce the um, biological efficacy, but it also can make the patient raise its own immune system against that molecule and potentially even over their own molecules similar to it uh, within their body and can cause severe adverse reactions. So life isn't simple with these and I think it's important to realize mm -hmm. that um, these also, these kinds of products are very susceptible 
to contamination by bacteria and viruses, which could cause even more problems uh, other than what they're intended for. So you can have something that could be infected with a virus that could be transmitted to a patient. So making sure that all these things are taken care of are extremely important. This is probably a good point to talk about government regulation and right. what the FDA does and what its branches do, CBER and CEDAR, on biologics versus conventional drugs. Correct. And I know you have a slide on that. Yes. <laughs> so there's uh, two organizations that are involved in the regulation of biological products today. Uh, one is the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, and one is the Center for Drugs Evaluation and Research. Initially, all the products um, made from both natural sources and biotechnology were regulated uh, by CBER, but around um, 2003, 2004, there was a transfer of uh, cytokines and growth factors and monoclonals to the Center for Drugs because they felt that they were more reproducible now in terms of biotech drugs. And so today, um, the, but they're still regulated by the Center for Drugs as biologics. Mm -hmm. So now we have both uh, organizations uh, regulating biologics, although the portfolio of those biologics is is different based on those decisions. Mm -hmm. And Ed, as a, as a journalist, does this make your life easier or more difficult that there are two different entities uh, regulating uh, various types of pharmaceuticals? Well, it'd be easier if it was just one center instead of two, but they, they pretty much follow a lot of the same procedures. The difference, of course, is that there are different staffers looking at different drugs, different therapeutic categories, but um, if, if, if you pretend that they're not two centers and just one is all one agency, it, it really doesn't matter at the end of the day, um, unless there's some sort of key decision, I suppose, that goes further up the food chain, so to speak, um, that's beyond the usual uh, staff review and then uh, committee um, exercise and then the, the center staff review again. Um, so it's a mixed bag. It, it, it can depend upon the situation, but I can't say I've ever been flung expired, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about clinical trials and the licensing process. Okay. Yes, well, the clinical trials, actually there's three uh, major phases of clinical development prior to licensing a biologic or marketing a drug. And these include uh, phase one. Uh, if I could have this slide, thank you. Uh, these are on uh, basically a small number of individuals. Uh, and the primary purpose of this uh, first phase is actually to study the safety of the product. And that's true for a drug or a biologic. Uh, oftentimes with a biologic, the, the initial safety studies may be with patients with a particular disease. And normally with conventional drugs, they will do it on normal human subjects. But that would be the only um, difference I could see. Phase two is then where you may have several hundred subjects. Uh, and here you're interested again in the safety of the molecules or the product. And also, you want to try to find uh, a dose that might be appropriate to do your, what we would call your pivotal studies for uh, licensure or approval. And that's called the phase three studies. And here, this may be one or more studies with a large number of subjects, uh, which you're going to continue to study the safety, but you will also study the effect of eff uh, efficacy of a particular molecule. Does it work in the disease that it is indicated for? And so that's pretty much the same for drugs and, and biologics at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if I could interject, Ed, uh, how do journalists cover clinical trials? Is that a, is that a field that, that reporters spend a lot of time on? Yeah, and also I would add that there's um, the phase four post-marketing. Um, studies that right. require of a manufacturer the condition of approval 
often that's designed to address lingering but potentially serious questions about uh, a side effect that was spotted during the clinical mm-hmm. trial process. And um, that's increasingly been a tool the FDA has used over the past decade or so to get drugs on the market, but try at the same time to cover the, the, uh, the safety base, if you will. Um, to answer your question, yeah, clinical trial coverage is extremely important because there's so many key go, don't go decisions that have to be made as results trickle in. And this starts at the earliest stages. The rage the past few years among investors, for instance, again, I'm a business writer, biotech stocks, bio and before they're publicly traded companies, biotech investments, venture capital firms, others, betting on one particular potential drug that a biotech company is trying to develop, well, what does the clinical trial result tell us? Is it meeting expectations, exceeding, disappointing? That will determine whether the work will continue, whether we'll see eventually, perhaps, the useful treatment. Uh, but before then, the decision has to be made whether there's further investment. So that kind of, that kind of story, that early stage development story, if you will. The same applies really, though, among the or two of the largest global drug makers because they're making similar calculations inside their, their, their labs and their meeting rooms all the time. Uh, really think, think he's through the same kind of process. And so there's the investment, there's a strategic, strategic development story, um, there's a story from clinical trials that can tell us, give us clues about whether a particular type of drug is going to be successful. Maybe you have two or more companies working simultaneously at developing a, a treatment for a particular illness, and one company succeeds or fails, what does it mean for the other? What does that mean more broadly for that line of, of development, that type of treatment? So that becomes a science story. That becomes more than just a business story. So that's another way of looking at it. And this all comes from what the clinical trial tells us. Then there's another type of clinical trial story, which is um, the extent to which clinical trials uh, data, that's slightly off to the side, but it's an important story, the extent to which clinical trial data um, that does exist is, is accessible to researchers who want to duplicate results. That, that's been a whole can of worms, so I think it's a cliche, for the last few years, and um, it's not fully resolved. But it also speaks with the importance of what clinical trial data tells us. And a, another type of story, even if this might be an after-the-fact story, of what we're learning um, and the kinds of decisions, who's making decisions about what to do. Again, go, don't go. And what happens to results that aren't favorable. Um, so those are just a few of the things that, that are worth looking at and keeping in mind on a regular day-to-day basis. Yeah, I think uh, just to add to Ed's comments, um, you know, the FDA has a number of mechanisms to fast track uh, medicines for severe and life threatening illnesses. And I think uh, that's where uh, phase four studies, as uh, Ed alluded to, really come into play because uh, that kind of accelerated approval or or fast track approval really requires some additional uh, study uh, post uh, approval. Uh, beside uh, that, phase four studies are often you want to look at rare events that occur once the drug is in general use because many times the size of the clinical study isn't sufficient to see rare events. And those phase four studies are very necessary in order to see those rare adverse events that could be very serious. So I think those kinds of things are both um, really quite Im- important for that. I also might add is under um, uh, the w- w- what's use referred to as FDA, uh, the clinicaltrials.gov site uh, was uh, instituted where manufacturers had to put all their clinical trials on this website. 
so that there would be public access to that as well as academic and government clinical trials are on those websites. So I think this is quite an important resource for understanding where information can be found for just a variety of products either under development or going through the development process which I think is a, a good source for journalists now uh, besides the documents that are alluded to, we can, uh, that is uh, really an important site to be aware of. Mm -hmm. Actually, let's go to the resources. Both Dr. Zoon and Ed uh, have put together uh, some helpful tips for journalists to follow uh, specific websites that will be useful to them. And these are Dr. Zoon's, if you want to talk through yeah. these very quickly. Well, the first one is the FDA's homepage. And mm -hmm. I would say this is the, the most useful one in the United States uh, because this contains all the FDA um, documents, guidances, rules, regulations, things about products that have had problems, uh, things that have been licensed or approved or marketed. So it's really a wealth of information. Uh, the ICH guidance documents are called the International Conference on Harmonization. And this really involved the uh, EU, the European Union, the, the US, and Japan, but others, <coughs> excuse me, have participated in these. And these are guidances uh, mainly for uh, biotech products and some conventional drug products. It deals with how to do good clinical practice, it deals with how to manufacture biologics, uh, biotech drugs and conventional drugs and assess them for safety. So they're very useful. And then uh, if you um, can't sleep at night, the Code of Federal Regulations is very important uh, because this is what um, regulates both drugs and biologics and, and they apply. and. Um, often the guidance documents uh, that the FDA issues are to try to put what's in the Code of Federal Regulations into a more reader-friendly interpretation of those regulations. Journalists are always looking for a reader-friendly. <laughs> so Ed, uh, what, what are the resources that you wanted to share with uh, journalism colleagues? Well, I think um, having the mentioned the FDA site, FDA.gov. I think um, you mentioned clinical trials. Trial. Mm -hmm. some, some of the sources I go to would be starting point industry sources. Uh, P-H-A-R-M-A, pharma.org. That's the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America. That's a trade group for the large global drug makers. And they um, will have lists of, and they'll also put out, uh, issue a list regularly have been stored on their website. All the different drugs that are being worked on by different companies, I'll tell you how many in different therapeutic categories, and uh, they often break it down between drugs and biologics. Uh, Bio.org is the trade group for the biotech industry, and um, they have uh, even more information, uh, not just about development issues, uh, but policy issues specific to biotech companies, and this runs the gamut from uh, legislation, both federal and, and state around the country, uh, patent issues, which may seem arcane, but are extremely important um, in terms of innovation and legal rights and cost and potential revenues. Um, I, I, would, I would really encourage folks to get familiar with the bio.org site, uh, because there are a lot of a lot of things that um, are warehouse there. Um, just in terms of policy issues, they, uh, they've been very active in um, the whole debate about um, biosimilars and how those should be uh, approved and regulated by FDA. There's been another issue that we didn't discuss today, although we, we hit, or I just didn't hit on that briefly when talking about uh, the extent to which they're similar, but there's also been debate about names uh, should be used for biosimilars, distinctive or not, from biologics. And uh, bio.org, again, has um, some interesting positions on that. Um, the consultant that I sometimes talk to, um, Ronald Rader, he has a site called biopharma.com. If you go to that site, he has a lot of um, links to other resources, position papers, uh, other, other websites for other organizations or companies. Uh, studies 
experience in some cases uh, it's, a bit, it's a bit of a mishmash but um, and you have to hunt and peck a little bit but it's actually worthwhile to get familiar with some of the resources he's like a uh, sort of a, an aggregator in, in that regard but um, uh, you never know what you're going to find and this is a uh, topic with a lot of tentacles um, so those are some of the ones that I often go to uh, most most regularly again aside from the, from the government sites and I would ask you both, what's on the horizon in biologics? What's in development that journalists should be aware of? I think uh, from biologics, I think cell and gene therapy uh, are really uh, going to be uh, the future of, for many of the con what I would call specialized biologics. We already have a, a product called uh, Pro Provenge, which is using a patient's own immune cells and treating it uh, with certain things to create uh, a cell that will attack prostate cancer and that has been approved by the FDA. There's also a lot of immunomodulators uh, and immunotherapy using uh, either cells or molecules that are important in regulating immune cells and those are particularly going to be important in cancer. Uh, they're called important checkpoints, which they're referred to, and which you want to make the cells that would fight cancer uh, more able to do it by inhibiting certain functions of a cancer cell to turn off the immune system. So you want to counteract that. And that uh, really uh, is uh, uh, something that I think uh, has, uh, we have one drug right now, which is uh, nivolumab, which has been recently uh, approved uh, for that kind of a therapy. But I think um, the approach that people are using too now is not only to look at one molecule for one type of cancer. If you find something that's good, say against lung cancer, you may want to screen against a variety of cancers now to see the the effectiveness of that particular uh, drug against a variety. Because what we're learning now is some of these uh, particular monoclonal antibodies are good for a broad cross-section of cancers, not just one. So I think um, the way we approach drug development is also changing. We would do one indication, one product, but now we're looking at a broader cross-section which I think will uh, raise more opportunity and actually benefit patients in the long run. Mm -hmm. And Ed? Well, I focused, as you heard, a lot on the, um, on the cost issue, and I think that the, I don't think it's gonna go away. I mean, when we look about what's next, I think the, the key piece that a lot of people will, We'll be monitoring closely is how fast we get more biosimilars in this country and as they appear what kind of pricing and what kind of savings does that offer in relation to what's available right now as part of that and this is a behind the scenes issue but a very important business story now are the players involved uh, we you know you it's not like there's column A companies that make brand name biologics and then column B companies that do or will make slightly lower price or lower, lower cost biosimilars. There's going to be more brand name drug makers doing both. Pfizer mm -hmm. has acquired Hospira, for instance, and that's giving them a uh, greater entree, particularly into the hospital market. Although Pfizer already had a biosimilar unit that's been motoring along for the past three or four years. Um, Amgen, which is a big biotech company, has for the past few years an arrangement with what is now Allergan to develop biosimilars. So there'll be a lot of different stories here in terms of how the pharmaceutical industry positions itself. And that's both a business story and an investor story. Um, and I mentioned the cost story and that, of course, plays into public policy as both government and private payers figure out what to do uh, to afford treatments, more treatments that become available uh, and hopefully are not just available but are even more prophylactic or more curative. 
So the resources that our experts have talked about today will be posted on our website. Thank you for joining us today from the Evelyn Y. Davis Studios at the National Press Foundation, where we make good journalists better. Today we've heard from Dr. Catherine Zoon and journalist Ed Silverman. Join us for our next webinar on this topic, FDA and the regulation of biologic drugs. Thank you.